Good morning, my friends. Let's uh, open our Bibles, shall we, to Nehemiah chapter 7. Before we see what the Holy Spirit has for us in this chapter, I think it'd be a good idea to take a trip down memory lane, if you will, and uh, remind ourselves of what we've seen thus far. It was not a pretty picture when we first opened the pages of this book. We found a devastated Jerusalem. We found a decimated and discouraged people. They were carted off to, as slaves to Babylon. We get a little insight into what their emotions were like in Psalm 137. It records their life in captivity, and from their own lips, they say, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Can you imagine being invaded by Russia, since Russia's always in the headlines, and uh, having your neighborhood destroyed and you being carted off to Moscow? They write, upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. Harps are there for music. And they spelled it out in the next verse. They said, our captors demanded of us songs, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But their response was, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? When your heart has been devastated, when your guts feel like they're in a blender and you've suffered great loss and great grief, if you've been there, you know you don't feel like singing. Finally, they're given permission to go home. Janet and I were just on vacation. It was wonderful. It's one of the first times we've ever been away by ourselves. All the kids, college are working. And it was amazing. But you know what? Inside there was this thing saying we need to get home. That great contemporary theologian, Dorothy of Oz, said it so well. There's no place like home. Well, they got to go home and they tried to rebuild their walls so that they could be protected, but twice they tried and twice they failed. Enter Nehemiah. He secures favor from the king and not just favor, but provision from the king. He's going to give his own resources to rebuild the wall. He rallied the people against the threat of a very devoted and overwhelming group of enemies and he got jewelry makers and perfume makers and homemakers and priests and even politicians to work on the wall. Amazing. And then there was internal division amidst the external opposition. And yet through it all, they rebuilt that wall in 52 days. Incredible. And now we go to chapter 7, verse 1. Look at it. Nehemiah says, now when the wall was rebuilt and I had set up the doors, we had a great celebration. We killed the fatted calf. There was music and dancing and fireworks. Is that what the verse says? I, that's what I thought it would have said. That's not what it says. First thing we read, I put guards in place, gatekeepers. Gatekeepers. They're put in place for the purpose of protection. See, they've won a great battle, but the war isn't over. The enemies of God are still there. As I meditated on that, I couldn't help but think of Ephesians chapter 6, where it says, having done all, now stand. I thought of 2 John 8. Look to yourselves that you might not lose that which you have gained. You see, the enemy's not going to quit, gang, and so neither can we. And so the war goes on. And the very heartbeat behind this war, you need to understand this. The pulse that drives Nehemiah to fight this very good fight is first and foremost a passion for God 
right behind it is a passion for people. You see, for six chapters, the emphasis of this book has been on a project, a task, something to do. Build the wall. It was inspiring. It was encouraging to see the people of God rally and, and accomplish that. But beginning in chapter 7, the Holy Spirit turns our attention to the purpose of building the wall. The people that the wall was meant to protect. Beginning in chapter 7, the emphasis is going to shift from something to do to someone to know. One writer put it this way, a city is nothing without its people. You know, it's very interesting to me. We, we built a building about five years ago, but the same could apply for us. It wasn't about building a building. It was about providing for the people in that building. The wall, as important as it was, was never meant to be an end in itself, my friends. It existed to protect the people. They had rebuilt the wall. I would put it this way. Now it's time to rebuild the people. In this chapter, we're going to begin to see the priority of people. Now, one of our greatest Bible study tools, if you've been with us for any length of time, is observation. Observation is a very simple tool, but a very powerful tool. And what it means is that we, we look at the passage and we read it and we reread it and we reread it, trusting the Holy Spirit to open our eyes for key words. Repetition, verb tenses, very important, prepositions. Trusting the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the mind and heart of God that he wants us to know. And I want to tell you, observation is going to play a huge role in this study today. If you'll do that right now, if you haven't done it already, take a cursory quick glance at this passage. And I think when you do that, I think you might come to the conclusion that it's very easy for us to not do a second reading, to skip over this chapter. In fact, I have some reference tools, some very famous theologians. If I said their name, you'd know them. And when I opened their books, they skipped this chapter. Now, I understand that. I really do. And I don't want to be critical of them. It's what I would call one of those kinds of passages, a list passage, a list of people that we don't know. It's a list that doesn't even tell us what they did. Their names are very hard to pronounce, let alone remember. And to make matters worse, if you look at it, it's a long list. 73 verses long. Now, I want to assure you, we're not going verse by verse today. <laughs> but neither are we going to skip it. I believe that to skip it would be a very big mistake. One writer, I am so indebted to him as I labored through this passage, asking the Holy Spirit, what am I going to do with this? I mean, my, my sermon prep professor said, and he said it over and over and over again, bore people with politics, bore people with business, bore people with sports, but don't bore them with the word of God. And I looked at this past and said, how am I going to pull that off? And I found this one guy, and he provided an incredible analogy it just leapt into my heart, and the Holy Spirit ran with it from there. He said that Nehemiah chapter 1 through 6 is like a movie on a big screen. It's got an incredible storyline with an insurmountable task. There are villains in the story, and there are obstacles in the story that as you read it, it keeps you on the edge of your seat. You ever been in a movie like that? 
But they're in, there's also a hero, and he steps in to save the day, and good triumphs over evil once again. Wonderful. And now with your mind stirred and your heart content, you grab the rest of your popcorn and you head out of the theater. How many of you ever experienced a movie like that? You don't go to movies? I mean, in the church, it used to be a sin to go to a movie. It's not anymore. I heard a story about J. Vernon McGee once. He said he had a couple come up to him back in the 50s, you know, during the fundy movement. That's not fun. It's a fundamental legalism. And he had this couple come to him and say, Dr. McGee, is it all right for Christians to go to movies? And he said, no, it would not be good for you to go to movies. My wife and I, on the other hand, are going tonight. <laughs> and the guy said, wait a minute, sir, that's a double standard. And he said, oh, no, it's not. You had to ask. And if you had to ask, your conscience is bothered. And you don't ever violate your conscience. My conscience is free. I'm going to movies. So have you been to movies? Have you been to a movie that stirred your heart like that? All right, let me ask you a question. When that happened, how many of you stayed for the credits? Can I see a show of hands? Not as many as watched the movie. The credits. In fact, looking at you, some of you are wondering what that is. <laughs> credits are where you learn who the people were behind the making of the movie. The editors, the sound mixers, the boom operators, the makeup artists, the cameraman. Why are they listed in the credits? Because without them, gang, there wouldn't be a movie. They all played a part, albeit behind the scenes in this blockbuster story. And that, my friends, is Nehemiah chapter 7. In Nehemiah 7... God is saying to us, I want you to stay for the credits. I want you to know who these people are that built this wall. They're going to contribute to your understanding of what this great drama of the redemption of God is all about. And I believe God is saying in Nehemiah 7 that he wants us to know the people in the credits because you and I are also in those credits. The work of the kingdom is still being done. And we have a part to play. And I think Nehemiah 7, though it looks redundant and boring, is going to be wonderful today as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the great redemptive plan of God that has been enacted on our behalf and that we now get to play a part in. Would you pray with me? And then we'll roll the credits. Father, at first glance, it's very easy for us to understand chapter, name after name that we cannot even pronounce, let alone remember. People we know nothing about, and we'd be tempted to ask, what is this all about? Thankfully, your Holy Spirit can open our eyes to what this is all about, and it helps us to understand what our life is is all about. Only because of you, who are the writer, the director, the producer, and the star of this great blockbuster story called The Redemption of God. May we learn today that like your word says, Every scripture's inspired. Every scripture is profitable. For your Holy Spirit has written it for us. May that be true today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's roll the credits. 
First on the list, gatekeepers, guards. The wall's been built, the gates have been put up, but now we got to put guards in place. That's as it should be. They should be first on the list. What good is a wall if you don't have people manning the wall, monitoring the gates with a twofold agenda? First, they have to be on the lookout on the horizon for a large scale attack from outside so they can close those gates. And secondly, they're to keep their enemies from entering the gates individually so that they might conduct terrorist activity. In my reading, I discovered that the Great Wall of China, 3,700 miles long, between 15 and 30 feet wide, 25 feet tall, was breached four times over the centuries. The fascinating thing to my mind was its walls were not scaled. Its walls were not destroyed. Its walls were not tunneled under. Every single one of those times, a guard was bribed to open the gate. See, my friends, a wall is only as good as the people who guard it. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit mentions them first. And he wants us to understand how dangerous the situation is. You see, once you build a wall, you can't let your guard down. The enemy's not going to quit. So if you look at verse 3, he also appointed guards in front of their own homes on watchtowers. This was an armed civilian militia. To put it in, in vernacular today, Nehemiah started the first neighborhood watch program. Mark 13, 37, Jesus says, What I say unto you, I say unto you all. Watch. Watch. And so first on the line of credits, as it should be, is the gatekeepers of the guards. Second on the list of credits, don't look. Don't look. I can see you. Instead, think. Who would you put next on the list? You've got the city secured. Lots of people to choose from. Would it be engineers? Would it be merchants? Merchants? How about teachers or administrators? Go ahead and look. Did you see it? Singers. No, 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 that's not how you're supposed to read it. Singers? That's how you're supposed to read it. We've got a threat of war. You put the guards and instantly you put singing. And next on the line of credits, Levites. There's a huge lesson there. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is screaming at us. Amidst all the necessities of life that have to be diligently pursued, and they do need to be diligently pursued, we must never forget who is behind all that we do. That is where praise comes in. That is where worship comes in. Praise forces our eyes off the vertical, the bios that we live. Excuse me. Horizontal. You knew that, didn't you? All right, you get up here and teach this. I'm... <laughs> Gets our eyes off the horizontal, what we see, to go vertical to the God that we can't see, but who is there, offering himself as all that we need in the moment of faith. Praise is the purposeful setting of our minds and hearts on who God is and in our relationship to him. In the next chapter in Nehemiah 8, Nehemiah is going to tell us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah is going to call for songs of thanksgiving eight separate times. Get the idea that it's pretty important. One writer said, joy is the flag that is flown in the heart of man when the master is in residence. What's your flag? What is your rallying point? 
Nehemiah puts this here, I believe it, with all my heart, to recall to our minds what God has done in the past. When you face a present danger, you need to look back and see the faithfulness of God over the years so that in the present you can stand courageously that he is not going to abandon you, but shown up in that moment in every bit of fullness that he showed up in the past. Isaiah 43, when you pass through deep waters. Did you notice that? God didn't say you're not going to have deep waters in this world. He says, when you go through them, I'm going with you. I will be with you. I love 2 Chronicles 20 and 21. King Jehoshaphat with a major threat of war. Listen to what he did. He appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out, keyword, before the army. And to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Can you imagine our generals doing that today? Going into battle in Afghanistan or Iraq and you send out the troops, but in front of the troops you got musicians and singers. Foreign to our thinking. The choir and the orchestra went ahead of the warriors, and here's the key, gang, it worked. The enemies were defeated, and Judah never even got to draw their swords. Judson Cornwall said this, saints who would learn to do battle for the Lord should first learn how to praise for God sends praise as the shock troops to drive the enemy back before the rest of the army is even allowed to join the battle. Praise is the affirmation of our hearts pouring out of our lips that we are in a right relationship with the living God of the universe who is all that he is to all that we need in the moment of faith. And so absolutely, once the guards are set, let the praise begin. Because praise affirms our heart that though those enemies may be there, they are not going to win. Third on the list of credits, administrators, verse 2. The ones who take a, a vibrant living organism of people and organize it so that it can function mightily according to its design. You do realize if your body wasn't organized properly, it wouldn't function. Can you imagine if your feet were on your head? Now, the one thing I've always questioned with God is why did he put a drippy or anything like the nose above the mouth? But I guess we'll have to wait to give it to heaven to get an answer to that one. Without those kinds of people, we would just be a blob. And we really wouldn't accomplish all that much. Now, two of these people are mentioned. Look at the verse, Hanani and Hananiah. And the thing we need to ask ourselves is why were they chosen? Did they have a glowing resume, years of experience, an MBA in administration, who's who's of references? It's not what it says. None of those things. By the way, gang, that's how the world picks people to lead. And by the way, that's how the world ought to pick people who lead. Experience, strong, confidence, energetic, charismatic personalities, go-getters. Because those are organizations of men and women. And you want strong, capable people in those places when you have an organization of men and women. But the kingdom of God is not, first and foremost, an organization of men and women. It's an organization of God. And we have very different requirements in this venue. What does he tell us? Why were they chosen? He says, because they were faithful. Can you imagine putting that on your resume? I'm faithful. My greatest ability is dependability. And right there next to it, I honor God. I'm a worshiper. I seek first his kingdom. You see, my friend, only someone with those prerequisites can be trusted to care for the most valuable commodity on this planet, this people. 
I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I want you to think about it. When it comes to the care of people, God does not entrust angels to do that. They're not equipped enough. He only entrusts people who have the ability and the potential to have God living in and through them so that he can minister through them. Only Holy Spirit indwelt, empowered people are trusted by God to care for people. Fourth on the list of credits, this is a long set of verses, verses 5 through 60. We're going to simply call these the people, and there are lots of them. We're not giving any detail as to who they are, what they've done. They're just listed. And right now, if you tried to read it, I would say, let's be honest, it's not very exciting reading. This is the kind of reading you do at about 1030 at night when you're trying to get sleep. And it makes you ask, what's the point? Talk to me, Holy Spirit. Why, why, why do we even count them? I love what Stephen Davey said. They are counted by God because they counted to God. They may be unknown to the world. They may be unknown to us. But God knows them. And God loves them. They are his citizens. They are the people who live in his kingdom. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible is Isaiah 49. 15 and 16, I know it's one of yours too. Can a woman forget her nursing child? Oh, don't read that casually. Is there a woman alive that could forget her nursing child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yes, the Holy Spirit says, even they may forget sometime, yet I will not forget you. Behold, listen, pay attention I have written your name on the palm of my hands. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. It says I've tattooed permanence. A picture of you. I've tattooed your face on my hand. Uh, If I could put it in the vernacular, he has your picture on his refrigerator. You matter to God. If there's one thing you walk out of here with today, baby, let it be that. I matter to God. And and because that's true, what you do matters to God. You got up this morning, that matters to God. You made your coffee, that matters to God. You made your tea, I don't know why you do that instead of coffee, but it matters to God. I've told this story over the years. It's a good one to say again. If President Trump showed up tomorrow morning to clean the toilets at Grace Life, it would be on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all of them. Why? Because cleaning toilets is national news? No, because of who did it. And you're a child of the King of Kings. It makes you either a prince or a princess. And that means everything you do makes heavenly news. You are so valued, so treasured, and so dangerous in the kingdom of God that when you got up this morning, the enemy said, "Uh uh-oh, they're up. Because you bring God wherever you go. Fifth on the line of credits, verses 16, 1 through 65, the priests. In their old covenant system, a priest was about sacrifice. Sacrifice is about forgiveness. Forgiveness is about restoration with God. And restoration with God is about access to God. So priests are the means by which people could be made whole so they could function the way God intended them to function, living from God, for God, unto others. Wonderful. 
sixth and seventh on the list of credits. Two more groups of people, but these are not good credits. In verses 61 and 62, we have people who could not prove their heritage as Jews. You remember in 586, the, the city was leveled to the ground. That means all the municipal records were gone. They had no documentation of their lineage. And Nehemiah says, sorry, you're not allowed to live in this holy city. In verses 63 to 65, we got priests who can't prove that they are descendants of Aaron. And so they're not allowed to function as priests. You can't do the ministry because you cannot prove your bloodline. Don't read this casually, my friends. This is hard. It sounds so exclusive, and you know why? Because it is. It is exclusive. And I want you to ponder it and enter into it. Your family has lived for centuries in the promised land. Foreign invaders have destroyed your city. They've carted you off as slaves where life goes on as it will. But life is different now. It's strange. It's foreign. It's foreign food, foreign language, foreign money, foreign clothes. It's not home. Finally, after decades, you get to go home. And it's a treacherous journey, but you make it. You arrive at your destination. You've got a huge enemy hovering over you, threatening you. You live in constant fear, but you persevere. You sweat, you labor, you toil with little food and little sleep. Remember, they had to do double shifts. And you build those walls, you build them to protect you and your people. And now Nehemiah says, because you can't find a birth certificate, the very walls you built are now going to keep you out. Is that fair? Is that just? Is that right? Does that bother you? It bothered the daylights out of me. I tried to wrap my brain around it. And this is what I saw. And I'm not claiming to fully get it. But I think I got it in part. And it made some sense. In doing what God is doing, he's on a bigger agenda than establishing our earthly residence. He's got a bigger agenda than us finding the right neighborhood to live in or finding the occupation we want to pursue. He has a bigger plan. It started way back in Genesis chapter 3 when man fell. And God instantly said, there's, there's going to come a seed. It's going to come from the woman. And he's going to crush the serpent's head. And he's going to bring you back to me. And in coming back to me, you're going to find life again. He further clarified that plan in Genesis chapter 12. When he narrowed down that seed line to the line of Abraham. And he said, through you, Abraham, there's going to come a nation of people. And I will preserve that seed line through that nation so that one day that promised seed will bless all nations. The point I'm making is that God had to protect the seed line. He couldn't let the seed line be corrupted. And so if you couldn't prove that you had Jewish blood, you couldn't dwell in that city. I would put it this way. There was exclusion for the sake of preservation for the ultimate goal of salvation leading to restoration when the Messiah would come to that seed line. There's a key word in verse 65. I want you to look at it because I want it to leap off the page at you. Do you see it? You might want to circle it in your Bible. Until. Oh, that's a big word. There was exclusion, but it was only until. In other words, it was temporary. 
temporary until a high priest could be found who had the Urim and the Thummim. So what's that? In the old covenant economy, the high priest had two precious stones on his garments, one Urim, one Thummim. And he used those precious stones to determine the will of God. We don't know how he did it. We're not told in scripture. We just know that he did it. And so Nehemiah is telling the people, listen, you're excluded right now. You can't live in the holy city. You're excluded from ministry right now. But it's only until the high priest comes. And he's going to have the Urim. And he's going to have the Thummim. And he will be able to determine your bloodline. And when your lineage is proven, you'll be allowed to live in the holy city. And you will be allowed to minister as a priest in the kingdom of God. And I have to ask you, did you see it? Did you see it? Through the circumstances in Nehemiah, my friends... God is giving us a word picture of the restoration in life that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5.10 says he is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest who lives forever and fully knows the mind of God because he is God. So what about this Urim and Thummim? Well, he has the Urim. By the way, you might want to circle that word. You know what it translates from Hebrew? Light. Who is he? He's the light of the world. You might want to circle the word thum, and it means perfection. He brings the light of his own life into the world so that he can make us perfect and righteous once again. So that we can live in the holy city and function as priests in the kingdom of God. You and I were the outcasts. But through that high priest, we enter in. Do you see it? He can change your bloodline, my friend. From a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve to a child of God. He can give you the birth certificate. The proof that you're a child of God. And put you into the ministry of the forgiveness of God in Christ. So that as a receiver of life, you can share that life with others. So that they too can find the forgiveness and restoration and enter into the family of God. Oh my goodness, do you see it? He established these walls to keep people out so that in Jesus Christ, those walls could ultimately be torn down. You ever read Ephesians 2? He's torn down the wall that separates us. We say it again, because I don't know if you understand, you really laid hold of it. It really didn't hit me till late in the week. He put up the walls so that in Jesus Christ, he could ultimately tear them down for everyone. So yes, is it an exclusive message? Absolutely. There's only one way into that holy city and one way into the ministry of the kingdom, and that's through Jesus Christ. But it is also an inclusive, because anyone can come. You just have to come the way God has ordained through the high priest, when you put your faith in him. What do we say to this passage? How do we appropriate it? Well, I gotta ask the question. Are you living outside the holy city right now? Are you a disqualified priest? Do you lack the bloodlines to become a child of God? You see, just like Nehemiah had a list of names, God has a list of names. And if your name isn't written in God's list, you will not be in the holy city. Is your name on that list? So, well, Frank, I don't know. Well, that's not really the issue. The issue is you can get your name on that list right now, right where you sit. You say, how? John 1, 12, as many as receive him by faith, to them gives he the authority to be a child of God. He will change your bloodline, gang. All you gotta do is say, Lord Jesus, I transfer my trust to you and your work on the cross on my behalf. And then enter the holy city 
become a part of the royal family of God, become a prince or a princess, and reign in life. I pray you do it now. Are you in the city? Are you a believer already? Learn from Nehemiah, gang. You better man the wall. The enemy's on the prowl seeking whom we may devour, and you dare not let your guard down. Every believer, realize this, is a gatekeeper of his own heart. John Bunyan wrote a book called The Holy War. And in that book, the main character is called Mansoul. And Mansoul is a city that has five gates. The ear gate, the eye gate, the nose gate, the feel gate, the mouth gate. And through those gates, the enemy tries to attack your heart. He'll sew up something to your eyes to entice you away from God and to find another source of life. He'll whisper in your ear to draw you away from him. You'll say words. He's going to entice you to say words. Should not ever cross your lips. You see, through those gates, the enemy can find access to your heart and function as a terrorist in your life. By the way, in the book, man's soul could only be defeated by an outside attack. Excuse me. He could not be defeated by an outside attack. He could only be defeated if someone opened the gate from within. So my question to you today, my friends, is are you open a gate that shouldn't be open? Don't risk the defeat. Guard your heart. Steve Green wrote, the human heart is easily swayed, often betrayed at the hand of emotion. You dare not leave the outcome to chance. You must choose in advance or live with the agony of such needless tragedy. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. Thirdly, a sad reality for most of us, at least for planet Earth. Please hear this. Most of the good that you do will never be recognized during your sojourn on earth. Not even those closest to you will recognize all the good that you do, even when you do it for them. It's a very thankless world, my friends. It's full of a lot of forgetful people. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying it's human. We, we just don't have eyes to see and recognize the goodness that comes to us from the hands of others. But here's the glory. God always reads the credits. God always reads the credits. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, your labor is never in vain in the Lord. I love Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. God's never going to forget the good that you do. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, I assure you today, my friends, you have a spiritual pedigree in him. You live in the holy city already. You function as a priest right now. You minister life in so many ways to others, ways that even you yourself are not fully aware of. But in that day when you're face to face with him in heavenly glory, you are going to hear, well done. And you are going to be rewarded. I've got lots of favorite verses. One of them is in the old book. 230. If you spend any time with me, I guarantee you, you'll hear it. God says, I will honor those who honor me. I will honor those who honor me. And so one last application. If God is going to honor those who serve, I think we should too. This doesn't detract from what you're going to get when you're face to face with him. It's just that we're giving you a little right now. 
And so let's roll the credits this morning as we dismiss. I'm going to read a list. And if you have done that item on the list, I want you to stand up. Have you changed diapers in nursery? Stand up. I bet never, nobody ever said thank you. <laughs> Certainly not that child. Stay standing. Have you ever pulled weeds on church grounds? Stand up. Have you ever counted the offering? Stand up. Have you ever cooked a meal for someone else? Stand up. Have you ever made the coffee for the saints? Stand up. Have you ever helped park cars? Stand up. Ever served food at church events, stacked chairs, mowed lawns, taught Sunday school, stuffed brochures, ushered? Stand up. Have you ever spoken a kind word to the saints? Stand up. Have you ever reached out to a visitor to make them feel welcome? Stand up. Have you ever sent a sympathy card for those who suffered loss? Ever sent a card of encouragement or thanksgiving? Have you ever cleaned up spilled church punch? Stand up. Watch this one. Have you ever given up your seat in the auditorium that you have had for years? <laughs> it has your unwritten name on it. And you gave it up so a family could sit there. Would you please stand up? Did anybody see anybody stand up? <laughs> Have you ever given financially to the cause of Christ? Stand up. Have you simply been kind? Stand up. This one should nail everybody. Have you ever prayed for someone? Then please stand up. My friends, these are heavenly front page deeds. Front page news that make up the drama that is playing on the big screen called the story of God's redemption of mankind. And your name is in the credits of those who did those deeds and played a part in the making of this great drama called the church, the body of Christ. So I want to take just a minute and honor these dear people who so often go unnoticed. Would you praise them? And now, Psalm 47.1 says, oh, clap your hands, all you people, and shout to God with the voice of joy. May we honor the one who has made it all possible for us to do what we do by making us right and putting the light of his life in us to be expressed by us to others. Put simply, I want to roll the credits for God with a thunderous applause and a mighty shout. Would you do that? Yeah. He left. I wanted him to lead us in a mighty hallelujah. Can we do that? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Prayer room will be open on the left on your way out. Go be the light of the world.